Sounds good. All right. So the so yeah. So the book is um, seven chapters and a conclusion. And each of the seven chapters, you know, of course, like you talked about, there's there's overlap, but but deals with with one group. Um, and you know, as a as an academic, and as a poet, I talk about you really have some great some beautiful turns of phrase, and also just like the 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 structure, right? I think that comes with an academic book, like through Duke Press, and um, you know, so we have very much like a a thesis for all you know of the chapters, and you know, and just the book as a whole. The first chapter is called Red Over White, and it's it's pronounced Susie. Am I correct? Yes. Right. So Susie and the Banshees. Um, talk about goth, and I, you know, there's kind of, I wouldn't say resurgence and never went away, but you know, like uh, Jen Ortega and Wednesday Adams, and you know, mm. um, goth. You write about very well. It could be reduced. It could be um, people can be very reductive about it, but. You write about, and correct me if I'm wrong, that Susie and the Banshees are more, it's not a horror type of thing. It's more like psychological. Um, and it's more like kind of like stand and be counted as different. Would she take, would they take offense? Would she take offense to the term goth? Like what, um, what were you, where were you going with that in describing them as goth, but but slightly different than maybe the the reductive definition we're used to? Yeah, so they refused the, the label of goth Ooh. because, yeah, because they felt that it was, you know, sim- simplifying the complexity of of their music, and mm-hmm. and I think that's absolutely right. You know, just to categorize an artist, you know, also means there's a certain expectation of what they should sound like, um, or you know, conforming to a particular style. Uh, but you know, on the flip side of that, I think you know there is a, a goth subculture that 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 really exists, and 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 Susie and the Banshees has been, you know, really pivotal for the creation of that goth culture. So, I think like about a band like Bauhaus, you know, who is also categorized as goth and who refused that label, mm-hmm. they have really kind of come to embrace it because they realize that, you know, it's it's not about how they categorize their music, but it's about how the music is reconceptualized by their fans and. Mm-hmm. And so I think, you know, Susie, you know, tried to distinguish between goth and what she calls goth with two Fs. Right. And goth was, you know, for her, this caricaturized, you know, horror, um, you know, identity or or, or label that um, wasn't about complexity. And I believe it was um, uh, the drummer um, from the Banshees, um, budgie who said that their music was more um more hitchcock than it was or it was mm-hmm. more blood dripping on a rose than um a scary monster you know okay so it's more hitchcock than you know some sure. kind of exaggerated you know horror film yeah and that, yeah. which those could be that the the more drawn out can be scarier sometimes right we can be more scary yeah and like you said the psychological horror mm-hmm. of things yeah mm-hmm I mean, that's what made Get Out so scary. Yeah, exactly. It's not a, it's not a slasher or anything like that. Yes. Um, it seems like, um, and the name came up a few times. Kid Congo Powers, and the Cramps were kind of a connection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so the Cramps were a New York-based band, and they eventually um, relocated to LA. And uh, their um, drummer Brian Gregory left the band, and they recruited uh, one of their fans, uh, Brian Tristan, who was re-Christianed um, Kid mm-hmm. Congo Powers. Uh-huh. And he became the guitarist for a couple of years. Um, uh, and Kid Congo Powers is originally from um, La Puente, California, mm-hmm. Southern California, and a uh, Mexican-American kid who grew up listening to rock and roll thanks to mm-hmm. you know his the older members of his family. And mm-hmm. He um, the cramps opened up for Susie and the Banshees in Britain, and so Susie and Kid became good friends. And mm. and Donna Santisi, who's a widely recognized photographer of punk musicians, um, photographed them uh, at Disneyland when uh, Kid took Susie to Disneyland for her first time. <laughs> that's a that's a great shot in the book. And is it is it um like was that the teacups or something like that? I, mean, I don't know. I don't know what. The... It was, but... The the tomorrow the Tomorrowland Rockets. <laughs> ah yes 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 <laughs> yeah 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 and um a, a picture is worth a thousand words but you you don't use a lot of words but you in describing the pictures and there's I don't know eight ten and throughout the book maybe more yeah um but they're really um they really say a lot and just the pictures themselves and then your descriptions of them make them you know definitely a, a very necessary part of the book the 
going into chapter two, which is called Touching Prince Charming, <laughs> but in, in, in ending with, with one, you talk about touching Susie. And touch is a term. I mean, we all know what touch means, but I feel like you use it. I, I'm almost wondering, like, does it have like a anthropological meaning? Does it have, you know what I mean? Like, I, I guess, how do you use touch um, throughout the book? Because it is very, seemingly very um, concentrated or very um, on purpose. Purposeful is the word. Yeah. Yeah. I want to use touch as a way to, um, to index the various ways that um, this music um, had a, had an impact on um, on various audiences, um, but then also the people involved um, in those communities as well, the musicians and the fans, for example. And so, you know, I use touch um, as a way, uh, uh, one, to kind of rail against the way that in academic discourse, the term hapticity had become so popular. To I had to register. look that one up. I had to look that yeah. one up. It was in the book, yeah. <laughs> one yeah. <laughs> and I just thought it was so, I, you know, all of that stuff was, no, I don't want to say all of it, but, you know, it was, I was so bored with it. And I wanted to, you know, kind of cut through the morass of the theory mm. and, and really, you know, highlight, you know, what these intimacies um, were that existed mm. uh, between, you know, listeners of music, um, all the parties that were involved in these scenes, um, to think about the way that touch is is a you know a, a a sentiment a feeling mm -hmm. you know so you're touched by um, a song it mm -hmm. moves you emotionally or psychologically but then the touch also manifests both um, in physical ways uh, mm -hmm. so that you know a, a brush up against someone uh, an artist putting their arm around you a mm -hmm. kiss and I think this is the significance of the title too you know in terms of the way that I think about how the kiss is more than just a metaphor, but it's a it's an act which requires, you know, at least two parties where the kiss is blown to one party, and in, in sure. order for it to, it, you know, in, in order for it to be realized, it has to touch its intended target. Huh. Yeah. How did how did Susie and the Banshees touch the Chicano Latino communities of of SoCal and and, and beyond? Yeah, I mean, you can see that in in a in a plethora of of, of literature by Latina Latino Latinx writers like uh, Juno Diaz and um, um, uh, and 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 other writers who you know reference Susie and the Banshees sometimes in passing, but it's always mm -hmm. about you know some disaffected kid who yeah. is like alienated or bullied at school, and they turn to Susie and the Banshees um, as a way to kind of you know, stand up and fight back and it gives them a kind of shield uh, against mm. the everyday abuse that they um, have to endure. Uh, and so I think the touch there is precisely about how this music has that kind of affective uh, possibility to um, give someone the strength to endure uh, in difficult situations. Hmm. Uh, I also close the chapter by talking about how I run into Susie yep. at, a, at a bar in, in Hollywood um, <laughs> and we, you know, she brushes up against me and, you know, we lock eyes and I don't say anything because I'm afraid of, you know, what the outcome might be. So for me, that was a really important moment to see her in that space. Um, and so that was also a pretty touching moment, as it were. Yeah. Has she read the book? I don't know. I've been wanting to give her a copy, but um, I don't know if I, I'm, I'm going to try to get her one. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, it's, you know, like I said, speaking of, of touch, chapter two is called, is about Adam Ant. Yeah. Um, touching Prince Charming. <laughs> Excuse me. Um you you write about I mean you you don't um nobody gets a free pass I mean you um you're very balanced um if if somebody is is guilty of something you're gonna you know write about it you write about how Adam Ant is he's racially aware but he's also very ignorant he's he induces a lot of stereotypes um and then you know I mean kind of starting at the end of that chapter you end with like, the show in Santa Ana I think more in recent times right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just the idea of, you know, Prince Charming is is two-sided. There's there's a darkness there too. I guess how did Adam Ant succeed and how did he fail in being inclusive, being op being um, you know, educated on other cultures? Yeah. So, you know, that's that's been a a, a point of concern for a lot of readers, mm -hmm. you know, when they ask me, how can you still listen to someone who writes a song like Puerto Rican or Juanito the Bandito and yeah. You know, and, and my answer is, you know, you have to 
think about the context. Like these songs are written at a moment where, you know, there are these working class British kids whose exposure to racial difference or um, people of ethnic uh, backgrounds from the States, for example, uh, come by way of, of uh, you know, the television set or the, the the movie screen and you know they only get you know a one-sided representation of uh, of those people who are supposedly um, represented uh, by these films or uh, television programs you know or what have you uh, and so I think the gravitation towards those images are all about you know recognizing a certain difference uh, with which they can identify not unlike the way that Latino kids identify with these British artists, hmm. but the way that they're kind of, um, you know, represented uh, in turn, say through the music, uh, oftentimes is is deeply troubling because it's kind of riffing off, uh, riffing on the stereotypical representations hmm. that they're exposed to on television or in film. So, um, so yeah, I think. You know, and I, as I talk about in the book, you know, some of those songs are really cringy, you know, as the kids say, mm -hmm. and, you know, I don't like listening to them. They're certainly not my favorite songs in his musical repertoire, but there are others that, you know, I still find very empowering and, and, and affirming. Um, but I also, you know, I think that's another form of touch too, you know, where there is this interface between the British musician and the, you know, Latinx or Latino um community or individuals by way of these representations that they're introduced to and mm. how they manifest in their in their song lyrics hmm. um, now, you, now you just said it is it, is it pronounced Bauhaus yes I've, you know I've always seen I don't think I've ever heard it said out loud I've you know seen no know the, know the name for sure chapter three is darker entries and um you know we, we talked a little bit about goth and you make um really interesting points about how goth is is often racialized you know like going you know people stereotypically people going out of the way to, to you know to to do up the pallor the you know the paleness and you know like in contrast to like dark clothing right and you know black hair etc and you write about how it's like you know kind of been deracialized but it's like well you said Bauhaus makes it clear like there's there's dub and reggae and influence from you know many uh you know musicians from the Caribbean from the you know from the British uh, colonies etc um, you know and then bringing it to to Miriam the great Miriam Gerba you know a more contemporary writer um, Taylor I believe is the last name yeah. and just how they how they resisted right how they you talk about how this so much about this book is so great about how you it's a mutuality there right it's not the British send it one way and the Latinx fans just take it they put their own spin on etc right so I guess just how um, how darker entries how that you know, the name of that chapter and how that relates to, to what Miriam writes about, about making goth or different styles their own, taking some yeah. and, and, you know, changing it. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, you, you, you hit on it, um, which is to think about, um, you know, the so-called goth music um, as influenced by different, um, you know, musical traditions and, you know, and I wanted to take issue with the claim that, you know, as I mentioned in the book, you know, that goth was the one musical form uh, uh, that had not been touched by black music, which I thought mm. was just really silly, especially yeah. when you think about Bauhaus's classic song, uh, Bella Lugosi's Dead, which is considered the goth anthem. Mm. And, you know, the drummer Kevin Haskins says that um, his his drumming was inspired by the reggae um, that he was mm. listening to as a teenager. And, you know, all of these British kids were who were listening to punk were also inspired by reggae. You know, you know, Don Letts, um, the famous um, DJ um, and um, musician in his own right and filmmaker, you know, was front and center uh, in the punk movement and in introducing these British punk white kids to this music from the Caribbean. And, um, and that's also what inspired the creation of Two Tone, where you have the reinvention of ska um, uh, and its uh, materialization as as Two Tone, where you have these black kids whose families had migrated to Britain uh, with the Windrush generation, and these working class white kids, you know, and they're growing up in these council estates together, and they're listening to the same music, and they create 
you know, a, a musical genre, which is a fusion of, hmm. of, of their respective, you know, cultures and, 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 and music uh, that they're listening to. Hmm. And so, yeah, it, it, I just wanted to point up those influences um, in a band like Bauhaus and, and how, you know, there are num a number of references to dub and reggae uh, in Bauhaus's musical repertoire. Hmm. And then, and then most, a few of the well, three of the members of Bauhaus migrate to Southern California, yeah. and yeah, you know, they're influenced by by Chicano culture, you know. And and so I wanted to show, you know, what those examples were. The offshoot project Love and Rockets, to, you know, they take hmm. their name from the Hernandez brothers from Oxnard, California. Um, and so, you know, those influences, as you mentioned, you know, are, are mutual, and it, hmm. it's it's an influence that runs both ways. Yeah. I, I definitely do not feel educated on, on goth music. You, so when you say Bella Lugosi is like the anthem, do you mean from from a certain group or do you mean like the anthem? Like if you were to talk about goth as a whole, like that's probably the anthem? Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's been described as the um, the stairway to heaven for goth. <laughs> that's, that's a great way to put it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, chapter four is, is soft sell and, you know, they're one hit wonders. And like I always say, man, I'd love to be a one hit wonder. It's just one more hit than, than most people have, right? <laughs> but, but you know mostly i mean you talk about n not only that but but tainted love and kind of connecting it to latina uh queer sensibilities and the the chapter is called the shining sinners yeah um diana was a woman you saw i want to say at a concert yeah so uh, i talk about yeah go ahead please i i talk about uh, going to see mark allman as a high school senior with a group of my friends uh from santa Ana and were moved from the back of the uh, the venue to the front, or the second row actually, uh, because the show didn't sell out um, and it actually was sparsely attended. Nice. And we got to see Mark Allman um, up close and in the front row was this glorious um, person who I dubbed Diana um, mm -hmm. after Diana Ross, I kept referring to her as Miss Ross. And, um, you know, she was just kind of a a sight to behold and um and I think also a memorable um moment uh, of that concert and mm. not only the concert itself but also just witnessing someone who was gender defiant and mm. uh, and just you know very self confident and especially as a teenager that was very um inspiring to me mm. uh, but yeah now the the writer his name pronounced Rechi. John Ritchie, yes. Mm -hmm. Right. So a lot about John Ritchie in this in this chapter um, that, you know, he was a, a writer who um, definitely, you know, pushed the pushed the envelopes. Right. In so many different ways. He wrote about, you know, I mean, hustling as a term for pros prostituting, basically. Right. Yeah. And just wrote very, you know, very like Diana, very confident, very open, uh, um, you know, maybe fictionalized or not, but but very confident in what he wrote. And just about how, if we're talking about touching, kissing across the ocean, you know, about how his work influenced Mark Ahmed, yeah? Yes. Yeah. So this, right? yeah. And, and, and I'm sorry, and the last, you know, lastly, just about like the the Puerto Rican, quote unquote, Puerto Rican drag bars in New York. And just, you, you really paint a picture of like, you know, pre-gentrification, um, not so, so, um. I don't know, cleansed is not the word, right? But just, you know, the the more touristy, you know, type of thing now where, you know, there was um there was very much a, a nice mix of people um in those days. So I, I just wonder how, how Mark Almon kind of connects with with John Retchie and just ideas of being confident in what he writes and what he sings. Yeah. So you know, I was really struck by the fact that, you know, that Retchie, who is a uh, Chicano uh, Scottish, um, mm -hmm. who grew up in El Paso, Texas. You know, his work influences uh, Mark Allman and Soft Cell in general, uh, you know, to write songs uh, that are inspired by this, um, these sexual underworlds that uh, that Retchie writes about in his novels um, and books in general. Uh, but, you know, it's well, Soft Cell's first album, Nonstop Erotic Cabaret, is all about the Soho scene and the keep album. shows. And yeah, it's a great, great <laughs> album. Uh, but they you know, they hit it big with Tainted Love. They come to the United States. They fall in love with New York. And um, on their second album, they have a song titled Numbers, which is actually the title of um, John Ritchie's second novel. Mm. And so Allman has always been influenced by by Ritchie's work, which I th thought was um, utterly fascinating. 
And one of the things about Ricci's, um status as a Chicano writer, a lot of you know critics have lamented the fact that he doesn't make an issue of his uh, ethnic identity, uh, mm. especially in his early work. And I'm saying it doesn't matter because what happens is that Allman, you know, draws on his work and and uses it as kind of a way to document these queer sexual subcultures that he's exposed to um, in New York and going to these, you know, Puerto Rican drag balls. Um, and so Soft Cell has a song called La Escuelita, which is named after the famous uh, Puerto Rican um, gay bar um, mm. in in Manhattan. And, you know, and, and, and you can kind of see the the way that Ritchie's work, um, you know, inspires not only Soft Cell, but also Mark, Al Mark Allman's solo work. Allman has a song called City of Nights, um, and Ritchie's first novel is City of Night. Um, and, and, and then I'm also, yeah, talking about the, the, the disappearing spaces of those mm -hmm. sexual subcultures um, and the way that they helped promote a certain kind of, you know, traffic between people of different races and ethnicities mm -hmm. and and class backgrounds. Um, and, you know, as a result of gentrification, those spaces are ceasing to exist. Hmm. Yeah. You, you also write about how, you know, with the title song, meaning the shining sinners and, you know, exotic, exotic, exoticization. What's the word? Exotic. Yeah. Yeah. And, and othering. Right. And, um, you know, conflating, you know, conflating Chicano, Mexican American, Chicano X with, you know, with Puerto Rican, and you know, using the Warriors as yeah. you know, that movie, as mm -hmm. like you know, you know, comparisons, and and so again, you know, you you have a lot of love and respect, it seems, for Mark Allman and for the work, but also not afraid to, say, you know, there's there's some issues here for sure. Um, I wonder about that the the title song and Shining Sinners about how that did lead to an exotization and 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 um, and othering. Yeah, you know, and there's a line in the song that uh, references, you know, well, it's all about Allman turning down the wrong street in New York and mm. reminds him of of, of the film The Warriors. Yeah, and, yeah. and he's staring into, you know, as he says, some Chicano chick's eyes, you know, who's about to beat him up or something. And uh, and yeah, it, it really is, you know, kind of the mapping on um this knowledge acquired from from film onto you know uh, you know uh, on the ground everyday life experience uh, with someone of a different racial background and the conflation of ethnicity I think uh, which I think is oftentimes part and parcel of representations of racial difference in film mm. you know also manifests in 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 a song like um, the Shining Sinners but um, yeah, I kind of I, I I wanted to title the chapter "The Shining Sinners" because it was all about you know putting the spotlight on these so-called sinners um, mm. who were kind of given their due respect uh, in the context of almonds and soft cells work. Mm. Yeah. Chapter five is zoot suits and secondhand knowledge. Um, how how do you pronounce it? Turk del Rondo. Oh, Blue Rondo a la Turk. Blue. Oh, not even close. Sorry. <laughs> Um, you know, just the ideas of like, I thought it was so interesting how you work with secondhand, you know, secondhand knowledge as zoot suits were in some ways secondhand, meaning, you know, past, maybe not literally passed down, but from previous generations, you talk about like your, I guess it would have been your grandparents' generation, like the 40s. Yes. Right. And just ideas of secondhand and that it's not, it's not, it doesn't have to be a negative at all. Right. Secondhand knowledge is, can be a great thing, you know, thrift shop, you know, as far as, you know, the actual suit. And then ideas of masculinity too, where in some ways people see the the suit and such as as very much masculine, um, but also doesn't have to be right. It's, it's been repurposed uh, more so for the working class. Yes. And then the fact that the 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 band you talk about they were multi multi ethnic, yeah, and really representative of of London in many ways. So I wonder about like the symbol of the zoot suit. And how it was how it was repurposed in the eighties and beyond, and especially in this type of music. Yeah, you know, it it was this chapter was an opportunity for me to think about the significance of the suit for both me and and my grandparents. Mm -hmm. um, but it was also a chance to you know kind of rem to recall the fact, and I you know I'm not the first to do this, but to recall the fact that the zoot suit had a life outside of the U.S. Uh, so mm -hmm. that. In the 1940s, you know, the the suit was also uh, worn by um, 
uh, Jamaican youth who had migrated from the Caribbean um, in the Windrush generation. Uh, and then also um, African-American sailors during the war had introduced uh, British youth to the zoot suit. And so it kind of took flight uh, then mm. um, as it did in the U.S. with um, African-Americans, you know, Malcolm X's autobiography, of course, you know, spotlights, you know, black youth wearing the zoot suit, mm. uh, Filipinos and in, in the U.S. And then also Mexican-Americans in Southern California with the zoot suit riots, for example. Huh. Um but then the zoot suit kind of comes back in the 80s, you know, and, and I, you can see this in Lowrider magazine in the early 80s. You see, mm -hmm. you know, all these photo spreads of, of young Mexican-American youths wearing zoot suits and, you know, the stores that are cropping up selling zoot suits like the one that still exists in Fullerton, California. But in the 80s, you know, the zoot suit is also kind of on the rise again. Um you know, and British youth are embracing it um, in the midst of the new romantic scene. So, mm -hmm. you know, the new romantics who are sometimes defined by bands like Duran Duran and Spandau Ballet, you know, are not only wearing this glittery, puffy, you know, poofy um, clothing, but a lot of kids are also wearing zoot suits. And and these zoot suits aren't, you know, the Anthony Price suits that are popularized in the 1980s mm -hmm. that are thousands and thousands of dollars. But they're actually, you know, secondhand garments that are found at um, at um, charity shops, and mm -hmm. you know, and and it's kind of this, you know, repurposing of 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 the secondhand uh, style as well as the garments themselves that make a um, a return uh, to that particular um, fashion scene uh, at the moment. So, yeah, I I wanted to play on this notion of secondhand as yeah. you know, not only in reference to the zoot suit, but also the way that you know, people are constantly borrowing from uh, things of the past. Uh, and then also, you know, cultural traditions that are supposedly not theirs. And, you know, and I wanted to use this occasion, uh, the occasion of this chapter to write against this notion of cultural appropriation, mm. which I felt, you know, easily, you know, for our shut down conversation about these, you know, really dynamic cultural exchanges that exist. And to accuse someone of cultural appropriation oftentimes forecloses the mm -hmm. opportunity to think about the way that cult different cultures are always influencing, you know, people of different backgrounds. Yeah, definitely. Um, Christos, is that how you pronounce? Christos uh -huh. Tolera? Yes. Um, he, you got to meet him. Yeah, yeah. I had uh, coffee with him in, in London and, and I'm still in touch with him, you know, from time to time. And he's a really great guy. Oh, very cool. How how did you know he was like the like the model like when the in the zoo suit right? Yeah. Um, kind of like a like you might say Latino adjacent or something, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I wonder how the band was how the zoo suit informed the music and vice versa. Just kind of yeah. like that, that aesthetic. Yeah. So it it really is the the brainchild of 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 Chris Sullivan, who is one of the other um, central figures in Blue Rondo, um, and. Chris Sullivan's written a number of articles about the history of the Zoot Suit. But yeah, I, I was really fascinated by the way that the band was not only characterized by their adornment of the Zoot Suit, but also the fact that they were playing Latin music. And as mm. you mentioned, you know, this music isn't just played by, you know, these white British kids, but it's also, you know, the result of two two particular band members who had migrated from Brazil to London. Mm. And, you know, in the 1980s, we witness, um, uh, my, um, you know, increased migration from Latin America to the UK. And with those two members joining the band, you know, it was like the influence of Latin music mm. that um, kind of complemented the interest of that, uh, of those other members um, who were always drawn to Latin music in the first place. But I think, you know, they kind of helped bolster um, that Latin sound. So it's an in interesting interplay that's both, you um, you know, concerning both style as well as um, musical sensibility or character. Chapter six is Mexican Americanos, mm -hmm. and you know Frankie goes to Hollywood. Um, you reference that that the shirt from I think Chandler nineteen in Friends. Yeah, <laughs> Frankie yeah. said relax. <laughs> yeah, and, and a lot about just like the the Englishman kind of. I, I don't think in a patronizing way, I don't think in a patronizing way, looking out for the press in the United States, right? Um, was he the one who came from a from a Romani Romani family? Oh, that was Adamant. That, that was Adamant. Yeah. Oh, was it? Okay. 
Um, you know, but um, but you write about how you know again, like you talked about with the the earlier book. Um, I'm sorry, the, the her, her her the author's name is escaping me, but how you know it was a great combination of the personal, maybe Hidalgo's. Oh yeah, Hidalgo right? and uh, Francesca Royster too. Yeah, yeah, Francesca Royster as well. Mm -hmm. And you, you know, you had the, the the very sad death of your great grandmother, who was really a, a matriarch in the family. Yes. And um, but there was there was joy in Frankie goes Hollywood. Frankie goes to Hollywood, right? There was joy. There was, you know, um, un, you know, unabashedly gay or queer, whatever the, the term you would use, and just vibrant in a time where you, um, you know, were very sad, um, for obvious reasons. And you also felt like is it safe to say that Frankie goes to Hollywood was kind of like the anti boy George as far as being, <laughs> yeah, they being they openly were... queer, right? Yeah, they were very much positioned against him, and, and Boy George was very vocal in his denunciation of the band because he thought they were, you know, too crude and you know, uh -huh. even, yeah. And I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that they were openly gay, and and he wasn't at the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and so um, the Americanos, you know, this idea of it it was written around the time of the IRCA. The I guess is that the same as like the amnesty law. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know yeah. there's a lot of different um, parts of that, but, you know, Reagan's 1986, the Amnesty Law or called IRCA and, you know, this supposed land of the free, you write about how the how the IRCA really had a lot of, you know, really backfired. Or, I mean, you can argue about how much it really was supposed to help those who, who had immigrated, and migrated. But um, Mexican-Americanos, you know, obviously is Spanglish in a way. I just wonder about the title of that and what that has to do with like oppression and speaking up for those who are oppressed. And, and again, that, that mutual, the kiss across the ocean. Yeah. Yeah. So that chapter, you know, as you mentioned, you know, it starts off with Frankie goes to Hollywood and I talk about, you know, at that time, you know, there was always this, you know, looming threat of nuclear war and, hmm. and the bands. Two no tribes. Big deal, right? Yeah. No big deal at all. You know, and, and, and I think we're kind of revisiting that. You know that threat yeah. now. You cry um, so you don't. You laugh so you don't cry, right? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm, yeah. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it was. It was a. It, the song was about that. Um. That. That threat of nuclear war, but it was also you know set to a dance beat, and mm -hmm. um, it was very sexually charged in some ways that was similar to their earlier single "Relax," um, and so I I kind of move from Frankie Goes to Hollywood to the solo career of Holly Johnson, who's the lead singer of, of Frankie Goes to Hollywood. And um, one of his first solo singles, uh, which was titled Americanos, and it was inspired by um, a newspaper article that he read um, on a trip to Pittsburgh, where his partner's family uh, lives. And he wanted to, you know, write a song that was all about the way that Mexican Americans had been in the United States for the longest time, and yet they were consistently denied um, recognition as as Americans, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and he wanted to tie that in with this, you know, ongoing, um, you know, anxiety about Mexican immigration. Uh, and you know, for me, it was really amazing to to find out about this song um and you know that someone who was openly gay like holly johnson whose um work with frankie goes to hollywood was so important to me also connected to my interest in in chicano history and it just kind of showed that there was this bridge between that there was a bridge that could be made between uh frankie's work and holly johnson's solo work hmm. And um, I wrap up that chapter with a personal anecdote about how I eventually meet Holly Johnson. Yeah. Um, and we meet up uh, over an English breakfast in London and we exchange stories about what it's like to grow up in Liverpool as compared to growing up in Santa Ana. And, and we just hit it off. And it was a really great mm -hmm. moment uh, where, you know, that it reminded me that there was, you know, that there were similarities um, that we could talk about uh, yeah. that existed between you know, growing up in, in Britain at a particular time and growing up in the United States um, at a, you know, a, a few, a, a decade later. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I read Holly Johnson, I'm, I'm assuming uh, female, but you said that's uh, from a Warhol, it's connected to Warhol in some way? Yeah, so he took his name from um, a Warhol uh, figure by the name of Hollywood Lawn, who was oh. a, a trans a Puerto Rican uh, actor in uh, what are some some Warhol films? Oh, okay. Yeah, 
Chapter seven is Lat Latin slash Latino American party, um, the Pet Shop Boys. And you you seem like you were maybe um um expecting some fallout from even, <laughs> you know, from even right calling them post punk. Yeah. Um, and really kind of including them with, you know, some some of the other groups. And they seem to have probably took on hip hop. I mean, what was hip hop at the time? Yeah. Um, and Domino Dancing is kind of the song that's that's really focused on. It was a critical and then ideas of like that. And I was it was that the video that was controversial, quote unquote? Yeah, it was banned by MTV. Yeah. Right. And you know, and you know how much that did or did not affect its critic the group's critical success. I mean, the the video was incredibly homoerotic. Yeah. Right. And therefore, like, oh geez, you know. Um, and so the question was how much did that really affect their their critical, their 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 commercial appeal? Um, you write a lot about freestyle, which um, you know, I was able to 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 follow up a little bit. It really, kind of piqued my interest again. How 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 are freestyle and I guess hip hop related? And like, what's kind of like the the Latino, the Latinx footprint on freestyle, especially through women, right? Yeah, yeah. So early on, you know, freestyle was considered you know part of hip hop culture, and uh, I think it kind of um, gets cut out because of the way that it's oftentimes regarded as frivolous or more of a feminine you know hmm. musical style that doesn't hold up against you know say the more masculinist um, narratives of what counts as hip-hop uh, but yeah so freestyle um, as a genre it's you know electronic based uh, uh, most of it is uh, you know it, it features women uh, on vocals uh, and you know people have drawn attention to their nasally voices mm -hmm. and you know the kind of uh, simplistic, you know, love gone awry narratives that oftentimes, you know, are front and center of a hip hop, or excuse me, of a freestyle song. Uh, but what I found fascinating was that it was uh, a freestyle um, band, um, or trio, as it were, uh, Expose, which had inspired the Pet Shop Boys. You know, mm -hmm. when they come to the United States, they hear Expose, particularly their song Point of No Return, mm -hmm. and they realize that they want to uh, make a song in the same vein as Expose song. And so they reach out to Cuban-American producer Louis Martinet mm -hmm. in Miami, and they fly to Miami to work with him. And they produce a song titled Domino Dancing, which if you listen to it, sounds very similar to expose's point of no return um as in like getting sued for it that close or um uh, maybe not that close but you okay. can kind of the you know the you know the i think the sonic resonances between the two you know are kind of they point to a, a particular kind of genre that makes it distinguishable uh, as 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 freestyle yeah you know there's that that famous vanilla ice thing where he was trying to show the difference between the beat for for ice ice baby and under pressure by david bowie yeah 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 <laughs> i think it's yeah. kind of i think it's become a meme now right? yeah <laughs> um yeah. you wrote really really well about um you know ideas you know authenticity obviously that's the term right what is what does that even mean in foods and you know is, is that authentic and i i assume eddie eddy who you write about i assume he's, he's a white man yeah check it right yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, just he was one one of seems like many who attacked um, the Pet Shop Boys for a quote unquote like you know the Latin sound in in authenticity, and um, you write here quote he whines, like I don't know if this is Eddie's words he whines about betrayal then betrays us, the greatest betrayal in such an appraisal however lies in the critics' inability to discern what a Latino cultural influence looks and sounds like. Right, speaking on something he doesn't know about. <laughs> that's not authentic okay then what okay mr eddie what's authentic uh, right yeah i feel like you know he probably wouldn't be able to say it right yeah i, I kind of wanted to beat him at his own game you know and and, uh -huh. and, and, and 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 really call him out for you know his lack of authenticity which he's accusing <laughs> other people of yeah 